Did you know that Exploration Radio is the official podcast partner of IMARC, the International Mining and Resources Conference and Expo, taking place in Melbourne from the 29th to the 31st of October. IMARC is Australia's largest mining event and is attended by more than 7,000 people who are all leaders and key players in the global mining industry. These individuals attend IMARC to network, to experience the latest innovations in mining technology, and to discuss the current challenges and opportunities around mining and exploration. Both Steve and I will be attending IMARC, where we will be recording interviews with key players in the mining industry straight from the expo floor. Are you interested? Why not join us? Register with the code EXPRADIO, that's E-X-P-R-A-D-I-O, at imarcmelbourne.com to claim a 10% discount on your registration fees. Hopefully, we'll see you there. As our industry becomes more technically enabled, people actually become even more important, not less important. And and I think even historically, even now, mining is a very expensive industry to get into. But I think the, the one heuristic that we sort of tell ourselves is that we are a capital intensive industry. But, you know, when we look at um, ourselves compared to manufacturing, we're actually quite a people intensive industry. But, you know, as we also um, move to IROX, for example, one of the really interesting conversations I had recently was with uh, some of the teams from Rio and BHP who were saying that, you know, as they moved people into sort of um, IROX, that one of the interesting things they found is that they needed people with even better collaboration skills, even better communication skills, because, you know, people were physically separated and so the emphasis on those, what we might have called softer skills, but all on those people oriented skills, I actually think is becoming even more important. Because as I say about innovation, the technology is about 30% of the problem in terms of the solution to the problem. The other 70% is how do you make that technology work within the business? How do you make it create value? How do you get people to interact with it, use it? Um, how do you get them to build upon that innovation? And so, you know, a lot of that is really about you know, what we might have called change management in previous uh, iterations, but really it's about getting people to take on different behaviours that add value. Welcome to another episode of Exploration Radio. I'm your host, Ahmad. When we think about innovation, we think about technology as being the main component we should focus on. The adage seems to be that if we get the technology part right, it is bound to succeed. This philosophy seems to forget an important thing. Innovation is ultimately about improving people's lives or way of working. So unless that technology can enable the right behaviors in people, it is unlikely you will get the desired result. This means that innovation is really a behavioral problem. You have to have the right humanistic design behind your technological solution for it to have the impact you want. Our guest today is Michelle Ash, who's probably one of the most recognizable people in our industry. Michelle has held several posts in major companies, the latest of which was Chief Innovation Officer at Barrick, where her team was responsible for rolling out a number of technology and innovation programs across the company's operations. She joined us on the line from Melbourne to tell us what she learned during that experience. Welcome to Exploration Radio, Michelle. Thanks a lot for coming on our show. We've been trying to chase you down for a while, and obviously your schedule has made it a little bit hard for us to get a hold of you. Apologies for that. Thank you very much for having me. No, 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 it's totally fine. Let's just say you are not the most painful uh, guest with regards to organizing an interview. I think John John Van still takes that cake in that respect. So let's start off with a little bit of background into you. So you studied as a civil engineer, you joined mining as a graduate, Yes. Uh, you've had multiple roles in mining, I would say, since that point, mm-hmm. multiple companies. Do you want to just give us a brief introduction to how you got to where you are right now? Yeah, look, absolutely. So um, so I've been in mining slash heavy industry now for 27 years. I was a civil engineer originally, but was attracted to, to mining from the beginning. Uh, in fact, Rio Tinto what was then CRA, um, was my first employer because I had done this weird honours thesis on extraction of um, gases or methane specifically from coal beds, um, which is all about fractal mechanics and how you know cracks propagate through rocks. And CRA thought that I would be able to add value to their research lab, um, ATD. 
But uh, very quickly, six months in, we realised that, in fact, they needed uh, blasting engineers much more than they needed research scientists at the time. So um, I actually headed up to Tom Price. And uh, as I say to a lot of people, once you've seen your work move mountains and, and seen blasts explode and things that you've created, you're sort of sucked into the mining industry. So not only that, but also the, the people in the mining industry are so wonderful that I've stayed ever since. What did you know about the mining industry before you got into it? Did you know anything about it? Do you know, I knew almost absolutely nothing. And that comes from somebody who had lived in Western Australia all of her life um, up until, you know, that point. And I had lived in Waluna, but Waluna at that stage was a closed mine. And so my memory of mining actually is as this fantastic French fort that we used to play, you know, um, soldiers and other things around, which of course was the old um, shaft and the old processing plant. Um, and I remember this amazing green hill that we used to slide down uh, with toboggans and other things, uh, which, of course, was the old sort of arsenic slag heap. So the fact that I'm still here is quite amazing, uh, given this story. Yeah, good. So, that, that sounds really uh, like a perfect environment for kids to be floating around. In, so that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. Exactly. I mean, all of which is gone today because that's been reprocessed, you know, which established the the mine in Waluna again back, well, mostly 20 years ago now. But um so I came into the industry knowing very, very little, but but I had lived a lot in rural Western Australia. You know, I'd lo lived in farming communities and things like that. I had lived in, in outback towns. So, you know, in, on one level, coming into the mining industry was like coming home. Were your parents directly involved with the industry or were they on the fringe or like, you know, service provider, things like that? Yeah, so they were service providers. Um, so yeah. my um, my parents back then were, they ran uh, Outback pubs. So Waluna, Mika Thara, um, Sandstone, so all in that sort of goldfield sort of area. Wow. So, yeah. Another fantastic environment for kids to be floating around <laughs> in. So, so that, exactly. That's a great you know, you get really good at darts and pool. Yeah, that's I mean, these are lifelong skills that, you know, you can never underestimate the value <laughs> of them, really. So we talked about the fact that you uh, graduated as a civil engineer, but mm. since then you've also done an MBA and an undergraduate psychology degree. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So I did uh, psych um, just after my um, engineering degree, well, a couple of years after my engineering degree, and then later on did um, some economics and, and an MBA. I mean, I can understand the MBA and the economics because I'm assuming in your role you use some aspect of that on a day-to-day -day basis, but mm -hmm. why the psychology degree? Do you know, the psych degree was, I think, the most useful degree that I have ever done other than possibly uh, engineering in the first place. So originally, I was up in Tom Price. I was a young graduate mining engineer. I'd, you know, done this blasting. I'd started to become, you know, a supervisor. Um, I'd been standing in as a superintendent. Um, I was about to be, or in fact, I think I'd just been sent um, overseas to South Africa and Namibia, et cetera, to learn more about being a supervisor in different countries. Um, and I was coming back to uh, Tom Price uh, to be a, a shift supervisor in operations. And, you know, I felt as an engineer that I was just completely ill-equipped um, to deal with people. You know, I knew about the technical things. But, you know, no matter how technically smart I was, you know, what fantastic designs or ideas I might have produced, mining is such a people-dominated industry that I felt that I really needed to understand a little bit more about people so that I could really not only lead them properly, but also, you know, so that they could take on board my ideas, um, my designs and, and do the, the implementation side of things. So I did psychology, mainly uh, looking at social psychology which is how people behave in groups, organizational psychology, you know, how organizations are constructed and how people then behave within organizations. Um, but I also did do a little bit of clinical psychology. So really looking at anxiety disorders and depression disorders, because one of the things that also started to become apparent, this is sort of towards the back end of me working in Tom Price, was that, you know, some of the those disorders are quite prevalent in the mining industry. And if you can recognize them, then you can really help people with not only those uh, those issues, but also, you know, how the whole sort of team functions. I think nowadays we know a lot more about things like depression, thanks to organisations like Beyond Blue, yeah, that's um, right. and how that impacts both people at work, but also how it obviously impacts people at home. Back then, we didn't know quite so much about it, but I just felt that we needed to understand that a bit more. 
So, the, you know, my psych degree is actually one of the degrees I think I use every day as well, um, especially when you're in business improvement or in innovation, because as I say about innovation, the technology is about 30% of the problem in terms of the solution to the problem. The other 70% is how do you make that technology work within the business? How do you make it create value? How do you get people to interact with it, use it? Um, how do you get them to build upon that innovation? And so, you know, a lot of that is really about you know, what we might have called change management in previous uh, iterations, but really it's about getting people to take on different behaviours that add value. I think this is a theme that we're going to dig into a little bit in that there's this technical side and this non-technical side of our industry. And I think perhaps as a technically dominated industry, we seem to focus on the technical side a lot. You kind of mentioned that we train people mm -hmm. on the technical side. We don't necessarily train them on kind of the behavioral or the, yep. the side of having to deal with people in, in different places. So stepping back, do you think this is a failing in kind of how we teach people in some sense that we kind of give them this technical toolkit and kind of leave them to figure out the non-technical side by themselves as they go along? Yeah, look, uh, so I do. Look, I, I think, um, you know, as our industry becomes more technically enabled, people actually become even more important, not less important. And, and I think even historically, even now, mining is a very expensive industry to get into, you know, to, to build a mine from scratch. You're talking anywhere between, you know, let's call it a billion dollars to $10 billion if it's one of those massive sort of big open pits. That's right. Um, it's not a cheap industry to get into. But I think the, the one heuristic that we sort of tell ourselves is that we are a capital intensive industry. But, you know, when we look at um, ourselves compared to manufacturing, so, you know, one of my experiences in my 27 years was being part of the, the leadership team of a manufacturing facility. And, you know, that whole facility was run with 150 people and it had a revenue of, you know, somewhere around half a billion dollars. If you take a mine site that might have a revenue of a billion dollars, it typically will have you know, anywhere between 500 and 2,000 people, especially when you add on contractors and things like that. Wow. Um, so, you know, I think mining actually is still very people intensive. I mean, if you think about all the activities that go around a mine in terms of truck driving and drilling and uh, maintenance and processing, all of the engineers, all of the um, service providers, safety, et cetera, you know, you think about all of those people, plus then the contractors, we're actually quite a people intensive industry. And then even as we change that, even as we automate, in fact, it puts more emphasis on a lot of those soft skills. So, you know, at the moment, even fantastic leadership reduces turnover, increases productivity, keeps people safe or make sure that they're behaving appropriately and making sure that the, the safety aspects and the risk aspects are, are managed. But, you know, as we also um, move to IROX, for example, one of the really interesting conversations I had recently was with uh, some of the teams from Rio and BHP mm -hmm. who were saying that, you know, as they moved people into sort of um, IROX, that one of the interesting things they found is that they needed people with even better collaboration skills, even better communication skills, because, you know, people were physically separated and so the emphasis on those, what we might have called softer skills, but all on those people oriented skills, I actually think is becoming even more important. So for people that don't know, do you mind just explaining what IROX is? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's sorry, remote operating centers. No, 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 that's all right. Yeah, so, so those centers where we start consolidating um, maybe some of the monitoring tasks, maybe even some of the, um, you know, tele-remote, now we're just doing it even more remotely sort of tasks. Um, you know, we put potentially uh, analytics um, centers and things like that together as we bring some of those technologies together and we create those centralized operating centers that can then help the sites, augment the sites in terms of giving them better information, um, giving them choices and, and in some cases uh, actually operating some of the equipment, you know, so the, um, the automated rail, uh, for example, which uh, are operated from a single center. I mean, I think this topic that you've talked about, that we should as an industry be a little bit more uh, aware of, I think is quite important. From my perspective, I, I find it really interesting that for a long, long time, maybe we as an industry haven't been very aware mm -hmm. of this people side. But as the size of companies has gotten bigger and bigger, I think it's a problem that more yeah. and more companies have to face. For example, you could be an Australian-based company, your head office could be in Melbourne, which would be quite different from you know, how a mine site could be run in WA to a mine site in Africa to a mine site in North America. 
So I think you know that people side is something that we maybe not focused on largely because the way the industry was yeah. structured, but that's definitely changing Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think that's a very good point is let's just say you even did have three operations in three areas such as, you know, one in an African country, one in Australia, one in a, you know, an Asian country or a North American country. Even if your technical solution to the mining and the extraction process was exactly the same, so let's just say you had the same processing plant or you know, extraction methodology, et cetera, how you operated specifically and how you interacted with people, how you drove people's performance, how you, you um, interacted with the community, that the governments, you know, the views of those communities and governments, they would all be quite different because there would be fundamentally different cultures that you were working in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think the other aspect we don't always appreciate in mining, which again is, is about how do you interact with people and how do you solve problems with people, which is that, you know, often in mining, especially in gold mining, mm -hmm. we might think that we're very removed from consumers, that we don't, you know, we, we make a commodity, we sell that into commodity market. Um, but I think some of the things that are starting to change is consumers having very specific views about how products are developed and, and the impact those products might have. So, you know, consumers starting to come down the value chain. And you see that, you know, even with Apple and uh, some of the technology companies um, starting to come down the value chain. But I think the other aspect to that is also we may not have consumers in the traditional sense, but in terms of our communities and our governments um, and, you know, how they see us as, a, uh, as an organisation, how they see us providing value to them and to their community and to their way of living. Uh, you know, a lot of people involved in that sort of conversation and, and people's skills involved in that conversation. Oh, completely. I mean, I think the reason why I was bringing this point up is I think right now as an industry, we're kind of understanding the internal uh, heterogeneity that we have and how we deal with people. But I think if you step outside of the industry, then you start seeing a lot of heterogeneity in how consumers, investors, you know, mm -hmm. the environmentally conscious person that looks at the industry in a different way, mm -hmm. service provider looks differently. So I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in kind of the internal as well as the external part of the industry which I think we are now being exposed to a little bit more yeah. and more. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we need to be careful not to lose sight of the technical skills because I think there are some, you know, some wonderful technical skills that we must have in the, in the industry, you know, geology, exploration geology, metallurgy, you know, mine design, et cetera. But, you know, I think also those, um, those people skills around, you know, humanistic design, um, sociology, potentially psychology, certainly leadership, communication, collaboration, you know, all of those sorts of skills, you know, also very, very important. So how often do you actually talk about that conflict between, say, technically upskilling people as well as non-technically upskilling people as well? Because I assume a large part of business strategy has to have both levers that you can work with. Yeah, so I mean, you know, strategy, I guess, is is multifaceted, and certainly, you know, with a with a lot of corporate strategy or with any strategy, whether it's a technology strategy or a, a corporation strategy, you know, you do have to identify. So, what is the competitive advantage that we're trying to establish or have? What are the, the core competencies that then we require in order to deliver that? Um, what is the value of that um, strategy over time? How do we deliver that strategy? You know, and, and I think certainly the skills that then have to be developed to achieve that strategy are then quite specific to the strategy, to the organisation. Um, you know, I think certainly what is becoming apparent um, and having led the innovation strategy for Barrick um, is that an innovation strategy is not just about managing the risk of the technology, managing the risk of the, the spend, but it's also managing the risk of um, the behavioural change. And, a, you know, a big chunk of that is upskilling and, and upskilling across the organisation. So all the way from the board, the executive, the general managers, the, the middle management and supervisors, et cetera, all the way down through the organisation. And, and, you know, we're asking even sometimes the same roles to do quite different things. Um, so, you know, for example, mm -hmm. an instrument tech or an electrician on a mine site um, is very, very different to what it was five or ten years ago. You know, they now need to know more about comm systems and sensors and, you know, how they interact into an automation system. That's a good point. And, you know, to be much more focused. 
um, one of the really fascinating things that we implemented into um, into Barrack was Wi-Fi and LTE underground, so that everybody could use effectively iPhones. And you know, we thought that that would be a relatively sort of simple transition. We were asking operators to to put uh, information into the iPhones that we knew where they're up to in terms of their task, you know, where they might have issues, et cetera. And, and, you know, one of the really interesting things is that they actually then started developing uses for those iPhones that we never predicted and, and adding value that we never predicted, you know, such as FaceTiming their supervisor rather than using the radios because they could call them direct. They didn't have to wait for a space. They could then FaceTime and then show them on video what the problem was. And so rather than supervisors traveling two hours sometimes to go from one side of the mine to the other to talk to them, they could solve in real time. Yeah, wow. But what we didn't realize was the extent to which we were changing the supervisor's role. So, you know, we thought we'll have pushback from the operators. You know, they'll say we've got big thumbs or that we don't like these devices. But because we worked with them and, and the teams were really agile, focused on the end user and the humanistic design and, and how they were going to use these iPhones, the operators actually uptake was, was really strong. But the supervisors had more issues because we'd actually fundamentally changed the concept of their role. Originally, their role as they felt it was to disseminate information. So when information was now being disseminated through an iPhone, they were confused about, well, what is my role now? Um, and so we had to reorientate their role and upskill because now it was around problem solving and prioritization of problems to still achieve the same outcome and quite a different skill set. Yeah, wow. That's a really interesting point. So at a macro level, you know, when you do corporate strategy, there's all sorts of things you put in place to sort of enable that strategy, you know, especially around um, skills and capacity development. And, you know, that could be technical capacity, it could be people capacity, et cetera. But sometimes it's not until you actually start doing these things that you realize some of those micro things. And you've got to, you know, sometimes recognize and, um, and pivot very quickly to, uh, to, to make sure that your, your strategy will still be, you know, coherently implemented. I find that really interesting because I guess from the perception that I have is that often I think we're very good at coming up with the, the macro things that we want to get done in, from a strategic point of view. But then once the variability of the micro things comes up, we're sometimes a little bit hesitant to adjust as we go along. Is that something you're a little bit more attuned to now? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, I think at a, at a macro level, we can nail a number of the sort of key things that need to be done in order to, to deliver a strategy. Um, you know, I think some of the micro things, it's just, it's almost impossible to know all things, be all knowing before you start doing things. So by definition, you, you need to start, you need to get on and, and then, you know, monitor, pivot, adjust, um, as you go and do that really quickly, um, identify quickly, adjust quickly, and um, you know so that you still stay on time, on track, for sure. Yeah, and I think I guess I bring up this point because I think this is something that maybe a lot of companies or even probably the industry struggles with in some sense. We kind of talk about the fact that we want to bring, say, automation into the industry. And it's nice that we talk about it, but we're talking about it from like a macro level. Mm -hmm. Often I find it really interesting, like you know, having worked at mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more micro level, it's great that we're talking about automation, but I would like to be able to have automated forms that I could fill in rather than having to fill in yeah. manual forms. Like we could start with something yep. really micro and then build to, to the macro in some ways. But often it tends to be this struggle where it's like, oh, you know, we've talked about these things and now we're kind of paralyzed to not know how we get started because maybe it seems too big or it seems yeah. too onerous. Yeah, and look, the, the way we started dealing with that was, especially as you go through these massive changes, these transformations that, you know, I think our industry is going through at the moment, dichotomies will always exist. And so we have to manage these dichotomies. And, and all a dichotomy is, is two things existing simultaneously that are opposites. Mm -hmm. And so some of the dichotomies we have to manage, or I had to manage as chief innovation officer, for example, is to be decentralized and centralized at the same time, to be structured and to be unstructured at the same time. I don't know what you mean by that being a problem, Michelle. I think that's like, you know, that's, you have to be yin and yang at the same time. Look, absolutely. But how many, I can tell you how many accountants and, and engineers, but that just that statement terrifies because, and, and even some companies, you know, I've had some really interesting conversations with, with companies around, they're going, yeah, but should we run our innovation strategy 
decentralized or centralized? And I'm going, it's not an either or question, everybody. You, you have to do them simultaneously. You know, you've got to have this macro thing centralized for sure. You've got to have drive and energy and funding and process and, you know, strategies at that sort of macro level. Um, but then simultaneously, and, and this is actually why I argue that innovation strategy should only ever be built on top of good operational excellence or continuous improvement, good digital enablement, and then you put the innovation strategy on the top of that. Yeah, okay. Um, because at the micro level, you need everybody doing continuous improvement. You need everybody coming up with the form to automate and doing it. But, you know, you might want that done within a, you know, some sort of structured environment that you might centralise. But, you know, if every last form is being done from a centralised perspective, you will never move fast enough. You will never get everything done. Um, and, and, you know, it, it just becomes too overwhelming you know, we started that way. We actually tried from a digital strategy to centralise everything. You know, we went round to all the GMs and said, okay, it was a bit like bring out your dead. It felt like a bit of a, a Monty Python skit at one point, which is, you know, show us all your projects. And, you know, we were thinking there'd be a few projects and suddenly there's these hundreds of projects that are flowing out. Um, and we thought, this is crazy. There is, there is not only no way do we want to manage all of these things because the PMO office would just be massive and the centralised team would be massive and they would be so far away from where actually things were going on that it would be ridiculous. Is that part of the conflict of, say, like the expectations that people have about innovation and basically the reality of what you have to do and get? Uh, absolutely. You know, the innovation is all about doing something fundamentally new and different in the organisation, which, you know, almost by definition means you are doing it at the coalface. Now, whether that coalface is in a function, you know, so the back office finance guys and, you know, changing their uh, invoicing structure or, you know, adding AI so that they can predict forward commodity prices better or whether that is in, um, you know, in your operation where you might be automating a truck or you might be, you know, adding in a new... Um, processing technology or you might be putting AI across your processing plant, you know, all of that is happening at the coalface. And, and when you put that technology or that new way of doing things or that new business model into your organisation and people do something different, that is when you have an innovation because you're now adding value. You've changed the way you go about doing things and, and value is rolling. You know, that doesn't happen at a centralised level. Um, you just can't. There's no way that you can know enough, especially when now you, you need to think about the humanistic design of these things. How do people actually do that work? How are they going to use this in the workplace? What are they currently doing? How do I change those behaviours? But what you can do at a strategic level is say, we need to automate everything that, you know, within this category of or group of things. Or you might say, we want to automate everything over a 50-year period or, you know, whatever your top line strategy might be. Um, you might even say, well, you know, as part of that, we're going to build this sort of centralised infrastructure and standards for communication systems so that we know that we're going to have communication systems across our sites that can carry the bandwidth and can carry the information that's going to be needed by those sites. You know, we can centralise cyber security monitoring and, and cyber security principles. We can standardise on iOS devices, let's say. Mm -hmm. There's all of those aspects that you need to sort of go, well, these things need to be standard, you know, and, and we need to have a, let's just say we need to have a control system and we need that control system to have these features um, because that allows us then to, you know, not only optimise each site but share that information across sites, let's say. But whether you have a screen that is blue and the buttons on the left hand side or the right hand side and whether your first screen that you go into looks like a versus b that should not be standard that should be in my view something that you allow to evolve based on the culture and the the group that is using that at the at the face that's the granularity that you shouldn't worry about yeah, I, I think it's a really good point that you make there because I think if you get sucked into like, you know, making sure that everything's on the left or the buttons are red instead of green or whatever, I think you get sucked into a wrong type of battle. You're getting sucked into kind of the nitty gritty, which is going to just take ages. Well, and, and that's where I think you can get inertia. I mean, it can become so overwhelming when you have to centralize everything, when you have to make all the decisions centralized. 
it, it can complicate the system um, as well. You know, when you do some of those sort of things, it can take much longer to get even just the basic product out there because, you know, again, this whole idea of minimum viable product is really around how do I get the behaviours that are going to add most value as quickly as possible by getting them a product that at least can do 70% or 60% or whatever the number is of what we want ultimately to do. But then they can start interacting, they can start behaving, they can start using those things and then we'll feed them the rest over time. So it's, it's you know, what you're trying to do is shorten dramatically the time to value of any of these changes or any of these technologies. That's a good way to put it. And that time to value is when you've got people behaving differently not when you've implemented the widget, whatever that widget might be. Um, so I think, you know, there's that. And then the other element that we saw time and time again was to to have choice is human. You know, it, it's what makes us human is the ability to make choices, to have choices. When you take away all of their choices, you're almost dehumanising people. So that is when you start getting more pushback from any new process or any new technology is when people feel that they've just got no choice. You know, when you can give people some choices, they will use the, the technologies much more readily. And I think, I mean, like the choice, I think, is also, I always think it's also a way to get buy-in. Mm, absolutely. You're allowing people to kind of be the, the architect of their own kind of future. Hey, like, you know, we're all getting to the same destination. If you mm. want to walk instead of drive, that's totally up to you. But you still need to get to the same destination at the, at the end of the day. Exactly. And I think it's a really, really interesting point because like, I guess what we wanted to dig into with you mm. is that there's obviously a lot of companies trying to do these big innovation programs. Or it doesn't mm. have to be innovation, but essentially any change program. And I think you often mm-hmm. see that there is a lot of resistance to these programs. And I think that's maybe because we haven't quite got that balance of do we do it centralized, one model for everyone, or do we allow different models? Yeah. I always find it really interesting that structurally, if you look at our industry, I think the centralized model will be a really hard model to implement kind of long term. You have to allow some level of autonomy between the different assets to kind of do what they want to do. Yeah, no, look, absolutely. And so that means you have to make a choice. What are the most important things to standardize, you know, to the business, to the strategy? And then what are the, the things that you allow people have choice on? That's a great way to put it. You know, I think the great thing from a technology perspective anyway is that technology is moving very, very rapidly. And so, you know, maybe 10 years ago, it was too expensive from a manufacturing perspective. It might have been too expensive from, a, you know, an IT design perspective, allow too much choice. It was very costly to do that. But, you know, I think these much more modern technologies now, both that are software based, but also even just some of these really interesting um, manufacturing processes, autonomous manufacturing and and very agile manufacturing, um, have allowed for the development of much more flexible products so that choice can be built into those products. So if if we just think of things that we very readily use, cars, um, you watch a, a manufacturing facility that produces cars now, no two cars on that assembly line are identical. In fact, they're all quite fundamentally different. You know, you watch them doing one model and then the other model and they're all different colours and some have got things on the left and the right and different sort of, um, you know, radios and all sorts of different things. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, that 10, 15 years ago would have been almost impossible. I mean, I think manufacturing has definitely gone down that path where kind of making things bespoke or customized as people want them has become a lot more profitable rather than trying to make them all the same. Yes. They've essentially moved the the ability to customize products further up the chain rather than just at the final product. It's like, well, here's your car. Now, what color do you want? You can now judge that right from the start that it's built. Exactly. So the other thing I guess I wanted to talk about, which is one of the points you made, is that in order to be serious about, I think, implementing these programs, you kind of have to have a a relatively solid baseline of operational excellence or understanding in the in the business. Mm. I guess the question I have there is, do you think in some ways we have to kind of run two cycles? One that is built on kind of maintaining existing processes or making them better and another one that's looking at changing processes or uh, adding more to them as it goes along. Yeah. We seem to have this thing like, you know, disturb everything, deconstruct everything. But in reality, you have to have a kind of a really fundamental 
maintenance model or flight improvement model as you go along. Yeah, no, look, absolutely. I mean, I think it is much more complex. You know, it's 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 not one or the other. It is, again, these dichotomies that have to be both uh, in place simultaneously. So, you know, you have to have people and, and your organisation very, very focused on continuous improvement, on operational excellence, on really sweating the assets that you've got, making sure that you're you're getting every inch of productivity, every inch of safety, every inch of risk management, et cetera, out of those assets within your business. Um, because if nothing else, A, make sure that you've got a, a culture of continuous improvement where people are constantly looking for improvements and constantly creating those improvements so that when you do come and implement something that is more transformational or disruptive, they're not resistant to change. They, they understand change. They understand how to implement change. Now, this might be a little bit more radical change, but they have that culture as part of their DNA. I think secondly, you are then implementing some of these especially when they're technology enabled changes, et cetera, on top of really well working processes. So you can genuinely see then the uplift or the improvement um, that pertains to the technology. So, you know, often, for example, once you put in digital technologies, the rationale for putting in digital technology should be that I'm now working my process so hard that my speed of getting information and my speed of making decisions is what is slowing that process down. There are either things I can't see and I don't know, or I don't know fast enough, you know, therefore my ability to make decisions is not fast enough. Um, and that's when you then put a digital technology on top that really adds value. So, you know, a very specific example to that would be you might be able to really optimize your underground drilling, blasting, bucking, hauling, etc. But until you know where all of your equipment is, where all your people are and exactly where they're up to in terms of their task, you'll still have breaks in that process. Yeah. Once you then put a digital technology in place and you can see that all much more transparently, then your ability to make decisions is much faster and you get more uplift out of that process. Um, but if you're not optimised to start with, then is the uplift just normal optimization? Is it the digital that you can now see? You know, it's always much less clear. And so it's much more difficult then to justify the, the improvement. And I think that's an important point because I think one of the things that often these programs struggle with is kind of showing that return on investment. So if you don't have perhaps a really good metric or a really good way of identifying what value you've kind of added, then mm. you know, it always becomes a little bit more susceptible to the message that people go, well, you know, who knows what's really doing this? Is it this? Is it that? So unless you have that kind of really well sorted out, then it's really hard to make the unbiased argument about that it did actually provide some return on investment. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, once you've then got this culture of continuous improvement, they're eking out every last piece, you then have some of those digital enablements on top so that you're now augmenting people's decisions. You've got much more transparency in terms of your data and your processes. It also gives you a bit more time because some of these transformational processes as well. So something even just as simple as, you know, I want to move from having diesel engines underground and people driving those underground to maybe, you know, autonomous or semi-autonomous uh, with operators in a remote operating center. And I want to add in electrification, let's say. The redesign that that drives, such as how am I reticulating electrically? What does my mine plan look like? How do I now stop those vehicles? Can I get something as uh, interesting as inductive charging to work? Do I roboticize battery change outs? You know, there's a whole slew of other things that, you know, much bigger process change. Um, so, you know, by definition, that's going to take longer. It's going to take more um, input from multifaceted groups of people. You know, how am I going to maintain these things now because they're very different to maintain, different skill sets, et cetera. That sort of more uplift or more transformative change or transformative change um, can then come in. And, and again, you can see then the uplift or the benefit of that change because everything else is running efficiently and smoothly. And so again, you know, you then get more confidence from boards, from investors, from uh, executive leaders that these projects, these technologies, these changes are actually adding value. Um, and so it's, it's much clearer then they should then implement it on the next 
mindset because, you know, one of the things I think we still struggle with in the industry were two mm-hmm. things that we've been talking about. One is we take our eye off the ball of ops excellence as soon as we start moving up the chain into digital or into innovation, yep. which I think then drives a knee-jerk reaction that ultimately people will go, oh, hang on, now our ops excellence isn't good enough. Let's stop all this innovation and digital things and let's go back and do ops excellence. And, and it's not a one or the other. That's a good point. You know, and I think the, the other big issue we seem to have at the moment is how do we scale these really great technologies um, from one mine site to the next mine site to the next mine site? Because if they're the added value and they're that transformative, then they should be as applicable to all of our mine sites that have at least that mining extraction methodology. But, you know, I don't see a lot of mining companies yet showing real skill and determination to take these technologies and really scale them across their businesses because that would be a huge competitive advantage. You know, if you could take a technology and go, this technology is so great that we could put it not just at mine site one, but mine site one to 10, and we can do it really rapidly, much faster than anybody else, because we know how to do this with our team. We know how to get the, the justification. We know how to change the processes. We know how to do all of the slew of things that are around that technology change. Then you would see those companies outperforming other organizations. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, you know, I think that will definitely be a competitive advantage. For sure. You know, I was asked recently two questions from an investor community. One was, do you think mining companies should own IP and would that give it a competitive advantage? And my answer to that was specifically, I, I'm not sure, it would really depend upon the IP, but but in a broad brush statement, no. Because the cost of developing IP, the cost of them continually developing IP, it is very expensive to do. And, you know, most mining companies, if you think about IP or or technology, they may not have enough mine sites to implement it across all of those sites. And even if they then go and buy other sites and we go, okay, we can do this type of deposit now better than anybody else. First time you do it, you might get a really good price. The second time you do it, you might still get a good price. The third time you do it, the market by now has woken up that mining company number A wants these type of deposits um, and must value it more than us. And then, you know, the third point, which is back engineering any technology is actually much faster and easier to do now with all these AI and other fantastic tools um, Mm -hmm. that we've been speaking about. So, you know, people developing aligned and akin technology is is actually a lot faster. So your, your competitive advantage with IP is not that long and then you've got to keep developing it you know and and you can't just have mark one you've got to have mark two mark three because technology changes etc that's fine but where i think there is a real competitive advantage because let's just pretend i did develop it as as a mining company you know you take a royalty but you want every man woman and dog to be buying that piece of ip yeah that's a scalable part of how you leverage it as much as you can Absolutely. Um, and they're now contributing to the development of your IP because as you know, engineers, as we implement things into our business, we come up with better ideas that you know gets reintegrated to Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3 of the IP. But it sort of relates to the second part of the question, which is they then said, well, how do you know if a mining company is going to be successful in this new world? You know, How would you place a bet on a mining company to say, well, that mining company is going to be more successful than other mining companies? And for me, it's all about what we just spoke about. Do they know their people? Can they drive them? Can they get the best people? Can they, even when they don't have the best people, train them, develop them, et cetera, can they really drive ops excellence um, and and continuous improvement and have a history of continuous improvement? Then overlay digital technologies, digital enablement, so they can now see and things are transparent. And can they then take transformative change and scale through their organization because those that can do that and can scale fastest will reek the benefits it's time to value they will get the time to value faster and they can do it across their business so they will improve and get those benefits faster than anyone else i guess what you were saying there is to me just seems very much like an open innovation platform really absolutely So one of the questions which I wanted to ask right at the start was, so your most recent role was as Innovation Officer at Barrick. Yes. What were you trying to do? What what was your ultimate goal uh, in that role? Um, So it was to add value to that business. Um, So we had a, a target, which was to add a certain amount of value over a certain period of time. And to look across the business, so not just improve 
the mining process, the exploration process, the uh, extraction process, so the, you know, the existing sort of revenue generation, let's say, from the mining and, and finding, exploration and, and mining, yep. um, but also to look at how we interacted with governments and communities, how we created wealth, created value um, to, uh, again, to try to expedite that process to create um, a situation where, you know, especially as we went for uh, new permits, et cetera, we were the um, the partner of choice because we could really uh, add value to those communities and government. Um, okay. And then the last one was really around disruptive technologies. And so that went across the business. Um, so it was everything from quantum computing, which is predominantly around uh, geology and um, metallurgy, but also things like, you know, thinking about some of these new gold products um, that are appearing, how technology might uh, be driving or enabling some of that, um, and to look at different ways that some of these technologies were being used that might also impact the, the business model. So that was quite a big brief, actually. Mm -hmm. As an outsider, it seemed like you had some successes and some challenges in your role. Mm -hmm. How would you grade yourself? What do you think you ended up doing well? What do you think were some challenges that you didn't anticipate or weren't able to solve? Yeah, so, so look, I think um, some of the things that worked really well, so, you know, as I said, we, we layered um, continuous improvement, business improvement. So we started there um, and established process and mechanisms. We then moved to the digital enablement. So we put together a strategy where we would focus what the ultimate value would be, the exemplar site, established team. We then split the role at that point. Okay. Um, we then focused on putting together the innovation component, which was really, again, the strategy, the process, um, yeah, the yeah, teams, okay. what would, would we would centralise, decentralise, all of that. And, you know, so I think what really worked, one was having those three pieces and building upon them. Um, I think definitely what worked was getting the changes as quickly and as closely to the to those that would be affected by the change as rapidly as possible. So, okay. you know, getting the exemplar site to run a number of the projects, um, then breaking off the digital team once we got to scale and, you know, to work with especially the technologies that were, you know, fairly well advanced, if not, you know, completely advanced. Hmm. You know, I think all of that worked really well because the innovation team um, had different timeframes, different metrics, et cetera, I think made a lot of sense. Look, I think there was some projects that we had to pivot uh, rapidly on. So, you know, when we first put together the uh, the centralised data lake, you know, I think we hadn't quite configured that project uh, because I think we hadn't quite realised where all the data streams were going to come from, how good that data was, what we were going to use that data for. Uh, within about 12 months, we pivoted as part of the sort of scaling process um, because what we had developed was great for, you know, a certain amount of data and for, for certain data streams, but it wasn't necessarily scalable. So we learnt um, a lot with that. You know, you have to kind of aware that you are going to have some level of failure rate or adjustment rate, anything like that with these programs. Absolutely. I mean, if you could forecast yeah. exactly how these things go, like, you know, we wouldn't need, I mean, really, we wouldn't need people like you because we would know exactly how things are going to exactly. go. So. No, exactly. So let's hope that in the future that is true. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that's so. Uh, you know, as we, but as, as an industry, as we learn, it will become more and more true as well for the for the things that we're doing at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we first started, we had very few examples or other organizations to go to and say, well, how have you done this? You know, what what worked, what didn't work? You know, now, not only is the industry three years later much more collaborative, much more willing to share those successes and failures and, you know, organizations like GMG that I chair are really helping drive that process. And of course, it's then helping fast tracking um, for, for other companies. You know, I think now there's much more opportunity to have learned from uh, from those that have already gone. Um, so we were sort of going a little, um, a little blind um, into some things, you know, not blind as in recklessly, but, you know, there were pieces where we sort of went, well, we're not too sure what we're going to be able to do. When we get to that point, we'll know more and having to pivot. So currently you're playing a lot in the startup space. And you've obviously yes. done innovation in big companies. Now that you have that kind of holistic view, do you think you are better equipped to do it in companies or better equipped to do it in startups? Like, you know, do you care to comment uh, 
what's better, what's worse. Yeah. So um, am I now better equipped to run an innovation team in a heavy industry? Absolutely. Learned a lot uh, over the last three years in terms of, you know, as we were just speaking, what works, what doesn't work. I think the mining industry has moved much more collaboratively, much more thinking about innovation. I think understanding more about how to go about those things. Um, I, you know, I think definitely I'm much better equipped um, than I was. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's life. You know, as we do roles, we, we learn and learn. The startup space is still quite new and, and really interesting. Um, so we did a lot of work with startups while I was in Barrick um, and, you know, really started to realise that not only did, did Barrick and did the organisation, the mining organisation, have to change in order to be able to work effectively with startups in terms of, you know, some basic things around our supply chain, for example, um, you know, so T's and C's and contracts and, you know, how do you go about doing a competitive tender if there was only one company with a possible technical solution and you sort of go, well, what makes that the only technical solution? Because you can also fall into a false sense of this being the only way we can do it. That's a good point, actually. The whole procurement process is built on certainty. When you're kind of dealing with startups, yeah, they're giving you exactly the opposite of that. So how do you go through that process? Exactly. You know, so the, so that was a big, you know, learning and, and understanding and, and things we had to change. Um, you know, even things like, you know, startups are generally driven by entrepreneurs. They're normally, you know, quite technically orientated, but not always. Which can be a strength and a weakness. You, you never know. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, but definitely quite entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so they're going to be quite different to people that mining companies interact with because, you know, the larger suppliers that mining companies are normally going to interact with or, you know, mining companies themselves, people that work in those organisations typically aren't as entrepreneurial as those in startups. You know, they're, they're more comfortable with sort of having a, a regular income, a regular workflow. They might be creative. So I'm not saying, you know, people that work in big companies aren't creative and, and you know, intelligent, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But there's quite a different style between the entrepreneurial style and the mining or the bigger company style. That's right. And so a lot of things that I was having to do was to explain to, you know, executives that, you know, they're going to meet a... Um, startup entrepreneur and so you know they're going to be a little weird um, you know they're not going to be exactly what they're used to yeah it's highly unlikely they're going to be wearing a suit yeah they're probably going exactly. to be like yeah, yeah they probably haven't washed or shaved in probably a couple of weeks Exactly. But, you know, I, I remember having this hilarious conversation because I thought, well, okay, I'm going to have to be thoughtful about how I introduce some of these startups to the executive teams or, you know, the, the senior teams. Um, so which one do I start with? So I chose the one that I thought was the closest to a mining company. You know, I knew the gentleman was at least going to come in with a suit, but he was going to be a bit, you know, different and, and entrepreneurial and talk about all sorts of different things and be a little bit wacky and things like that. And I remember one of the senior people coming to me afterwards going, oh, my God, where did you get that guy? And I'm going, uh, I'm going, man, you know, he is the best, all, all my entrepreneurs. You wait till I show you some of the really odd people that, uh, that enter into the startup space. So, you know, like you, you have to go through this process of, of also how do I get these two quite different cultural groups to come together and to, you know, to listen to each other, to respect each other, to come up with a solution because I know there's a great problem to solve and there's some really good solutions um, to those problems. And then, you know, what I find myself doing now on the entrepreneurial side or the, or the startup side, it's sort of the same but the other way around because what ends up happening is mining companies can demand a lot more than what um, startups can necessarily give, but startups want to be, you know, want to, to satisfy their customer. That's a great point, actually. The, 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 the way the companies, you know, mining companies kind of deal with startups, I think, has to somewhat change as well because the value proposition Absolutely. is not the same on either side. So I think we have to be a little bit cognizant of, of what we're asking from companies as well. Yeah, no, exactly. And so, you know, one of the things that I um, I spend a bit of time with uh, startup organisations doing other than, you know, trying to get them to be thoughtful about their pitch and talk about value first and, you know, the technology maybe second or third um, is also to be clear with people the consequence of some of the things that they're asking for. 
because, you know, I think often sometimes in mining companies, we, we A, don't know, um, or just, you know, not thoughtful necessarily about the consequence of what could be quite a simple change or a quick, simple request in, in our mind. For me, it's been really interesting working on both sides of that equation um, and, you know, trying to work with mining companies to make them better enabled to work with startups to tap into that ecosystem, to work with partners in partnership and then with startups to get them to be a little more structured and thoughtful, work out how to scale and grow their business. So it is actually really interesting working with both sides. Uh, I don't think one is better than the other, you know, working with both simultaneously actually is, is a lot of fun. So, Michelle, tomorrow I try to hire you as an innovation officer again for a major mining company. Would you do it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you haven't been that scarred, let's just say that. <laughs> no, no. I, I actually really enjoyed um, the role with Barrick. I've been, you know, loving working with GMG, which is an industry association. I've been a, a volunteer. I've been their, their chair for 18 months now. You know, it's great working across the industry with different mining companies. The fact that more mining companies are thinking about innovation, getting engaged with at least technology enablement side and, and how they, they might then implement those into their businesses, even having those conversations, I think is fantastic. And, and certainly one of the things I'm really passionate about is how do we speed up the mining industry's rate of change? Because no matter how great our rate of change has been, and it has been over 30 years I've worked in mining, it's a very different industry now than what it was 30 years ago. But we're still not able to keep up the pace sufficiently to sort of um, beat the pace at which society's expectations of us is changing. That's a great point. And so, you know, we're going to have to speed up that rate of change. And that's what I'm really passionate to be part of and, and to be doing. I mean, I think from, from my own selfish view, I think having... People like yourself involved with groups like GMG, I think is, is fantastic because I think we need to kind of take the lessons that yourself and other people in this space are going through, the successes or the challenges that you deal with. And I think by allowing that to kind of be a little bit more broadly spread out within the industry, I think will inevitably allow someone else that's sitting in your position struggling with the same problem to then be able to do something. So I think the fact that you're involved with groups like GMG, I think is fantastic. Yeah, no, it is good. It's great fun. Two last questions. So what is something in our industry, it could be an idea, a concept, a behavior that you think needs to die in mining? Anything that you think that we need to jettison out of the industry? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think for me, the industry's greatest strength is also its greatest weakness. And that's the same with all of us. The mining industry's greatest strength is when things are going wrong and the plan is changing and, you know, things aren't working. We come up with a plan, we make it happen, and we still achieve the results. Um, and, you know, that's what we've been great at as an industry. The, on the greatest weakness side of that um, is that it can mean that we don't want to do something until we've already seen it done. You know, so how do you come up with these plans and, and make things work even when they, they might be sort of not working? It's because we implement things that we've done before um, and we know that that's worked. And so, you know, I think... This, this idea around needing to see something implemented before we can sort of absolutely know that it's, it's the right way to go and maybe even see it implemented 10 or 20 or 30 times before we're comfortable with it, that is now retarding our progress um, and our speed to change. And, and I think related to that is, you know, I think we use the word never sometimes a little more often. I certainly know whenever I've used the word never, I have always been wrong. Um, and, and I remember speaking to um, a group of CEOs a few years ago when I started uh, saying to them that, you know, we had to develop a concept in the industry where we had zero people underground, you know, and, and both from a safety perspective and a productivity expector, and then we could redesign the industry. And I remember some of the people in that group saying to me, Michelle, we will never be able to have zero people underground. And a highlight of my year last year was one of those people who were in that group saying, well, we'll never be able to have zero people underground, was at a conference and they were talking and they were talking about this idea of having zero people underground um, at some point you know, in the future. Um, so I'm going, okay, fantastic. That's a little win. We've got one of the never words out of our industry. Um, <laughs> 
I think the the strength and the weakness, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, like we, as an industry, would not have been able to accomplish the things we we have done considering the remote places we work in, the, you know, the technology development that we've had, the way we work now, if we didn't have this tunnel vision focus or this insular focus on getting things done. But that's also, I think, our biggest weakness is because we sometimes are not very amenable to change when we're in that process as well. Yeah. Conversely, what is something that you think we should maintain in our industry at all costs? Something that's fundamental to our DNA that we should never forget. I think one of the things that I've always loved about the mining industry is, you know, especially when you're on a mine site or you know, any part of the industry, is that people are really helpful and accommodating. And, you know, and I, so I think this whole idea of people being part of the mining industry as being fundamental um, and us being collaborative and problem solvers and working together, I think that is something we should never lose sight of. You know, our industry is a people industry, whether it is the impacts that we have on our communities, whether it's the impacts we have on our governments, um, or whether it be the people within our organisation or even the, the wider group of people that we partner with and solve problems with. You know, I, I think we should never forget our humanity and we should never forget as well that we are an industry who builds countries, builds communities. I always reflect on the fact that, you know, Australia, it, it's real big kicker as a country um, came when we found gold and, you know, gold then built banks and roads and infrastructure and all the other wonderful things that it did back then. And, you know, you see that in, in countries now. The natural resources and, and um, mining as part of natural resources is what underpins the, uh, the great um, standard of living that we have in developed countries and hopefully will be what helps underpin the great standard of living that uh, developing countries will eventually also um, obtain. We had a recent interview where someone mentioned that if you think about where a large part of California's wealth came from, it really came from the gold rush. And mm. you, could, you could probably see that value being transferred from the gold industry to Hollywood, then to uh, you know, the oil and gas industry, then to space, and now into technology. So yeah. if you look far enough back, large moment of wealth generation tends to have something to do with natural resources. So Australia, yeah. I think, is a classic example of that. So that's it, Michelle. That's the end of our interview. So thanks a lot for coming on our show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a great opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. Exploration Radio is brought to you by Steve and Ahmad. This episode was produced and edited by Ahmad and recorded at Vision Studios in Perth. If you want to find out more about this podcast, check us out on explorationradio.com or follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. And we're even on Instagram. And if you like this podcast and want to help out, well, there's two things you can do for us. Give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And consider supporting us in producing more of this content. You can find the details on how to do that on our website at explorationradio.com support. Until next time, let's keep exploring.